ASEAN Dailies, first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hi, this is Arlene. Hi, this is Gauri. And of course, you are listening to us at our usual morning coffee for our news. On Southeast Asia. That's <laughs> right. And we're talking about the ASEAN Daily where we are going to bring our listeners news from all over Southeast Asia. So first of all, Gary, I have to go to your ancestor <laughs> land <Okay. laughs> to talk about a news that is, um, well, we talk about it all the time in Southeast mm. Asia, which is about air pollution. But of course, India is also uh you know, one of those countries that they need to address or manage issues regarding on air quality. And apparently, Gauri, yes, I don't, want, I don't want to hurt your <laughs> feeling. <laughs> quote, I unquote, doubt my feelings quote, will unquote, be hurt. <laughs> but India uh, will be measuring air quality in the world's most polluted capital, which is in New Delhi, if I'm not mistaken. And it seems that they were under very intense pressure to act after the World Health Organization declared New Delhi as the world's most polluted capital, that they were actually forced to launch a new air quality index just to measure that. It's crazy. And I thought China was probably the world's most polluted place because I, I was mm-hmm. there uh, cup, uh, two years ago mm-hmm. when it was very cold and instead of managing the coldness by wearing more clothes, they burned more coal or there were more cars on the street mm-hmm. and the air was extremely polluted that I developed some coughing illness. Okay. <laughs> but you don't have to worry about it because uh, Beijing is actually uh, in second place. It's very close <laughs> behind <laughs> I they might so be taking hurt. over they are India. <laughs> they might overtake India sooner or later because of the number of cars, like you mentioned. Uh, but for now, New Delhi is still on top of the list. Of course, not in a good way. <laughs> and uh, it seems that, especially in the urban areas, the air quality is really, really bad, and they're trying their best to. Uh, go about it by increasing the public awareness in cities and trying to take some steps. But it's a long way to go to uh, clear up an entire city and to make it uh, free of pollution. I think if there's a political will among mm-hmm. political leaders, especially in New Delhi, I I don't think it's such... I don't think it won't be uh, impossible. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, uh, a lot of the dust from uh, thousands of industrial and construction sites is the reason why there's just so many uh, pollution as well as uh, the fumes from millions of vehicles to create toxic cocktail in the urban mm. Indian bre- uh, breath. But to me, the, the thing that is manageable is to make sure that industrial mm. sites, they, they somehow uh, have certain kind of standards where they don't release that many fumes the same with vehicles Mm -hmm. you know maybe they can have better quality vehicles on the road and that's uh, another thing that they have to look at as well when it comes to industrial waste of course with the thousands and thousands of factories it's probably uh, difficult for them to keep track as well if everyone is actually following the regulations uh, that were set and as a result they actually have 3,000 people who die prematurely every year in India's capital because of the high exposure to air pollution. Mm -hmm. And it seems that it's one of the the leading uh, cause of death and it's uh, something that they should be addressing quick enough because air pollution, uh, you know, people... We breathe all the time, we breathe every day and it's not something that we can just stop doing because of the pollution and every time that you breathe, when you take in all this uh, toxic, uh, all these chemicals, uh, it really does have a very bad effect, not only on on the, the first-hand people, but even if you're pregnant, or you, you just pass it on you're ge- right. genetically. You're right, I mean, probably worse than smoking. And... Uh, <laughs> It seems that the policy makers uh, are also trying to suggest a restriction on private vehicles, uh, higher pollution-related taxes, and stricter enforcement of urban planning laws. So I guess like you mentioned, if there's a political will, it can be done, but uh, I, I still think it's going to be really, really I think, tough. I think they need to relocate mm-hmm. those industrial sites where they have they, they produce a lot of fumes because at the, or smokes because at the end of the day you don't want people you know living in a housing area that mm-hmm. is so close or so near to industrial sites and uh, going back to that as well uh, just changing the laws alone is not enough they have to make sure that they have the uh, 
the specific bodies to actually make sure that uh, the laws are being enforced and people are actually following it. Sounds like we are policy makers also. <laughs> <laughs> Do we? <laughs> anyway, uh, talking about policy makers, uh, Malaysian policy makers are going, uh, have passed a controversial anti-terror bill. There you go. We have been discussing this quite some time mm-hmm. ago uh, that they were debating on this particular law, it's a terrorism uh, bill where Malaysia will be uh, using this bill to control or manage uh, terrorist activities since uh, it's somehow been an, hu- mm-hmm. a huge issue, not just in Malaysia but the rest of Southeast Asia. But if, when it comes to Malaysia, we... I guess Malaysians tend to be very skeptical when, when there's a new law or a new regulation, especially things to do with security, because uh, more often than not, uh, whether they agree or not, it seems like for the larger majority, the laws are always being used for the wrong reasons and uh, not in the context that it should be used. And mm. especially the people who are worried here are, of course, people from the opposition party uh, who are f- fearing that the bill will be used against them uh, despite a clause that excludes political belief or activity as grounds for detention. I Maybe I'm just being uh, extremely uh, realist in this, but mm-hmm. I do think we need an anti-terror bill because terrorism activities, they are not on the same level of playing field when it mm-hmm. comes to you know hate speech or political activities it's on another ground where it's all about you know harming people mm-hmm. terrorizing people and i think that we need a law to address that in the past of course we have isa mm-hmm. but now but, but with isa being dismantled i think we need a very very specific law where it addresses terrorism activities and not activities that unrelated to terrorism so i think malaysian government needs to be very very ca- careful mm-hmm. when implementing the bill make sure that you know people who are not related to the terrorism act should not be punishable or should not be included in that particular bill but then again uh, even with the ISA that we had it was also used uh, very controversially a lot of people uh, who in uh, in their context, they were standing up for the rights of the people, but they were arrested uh, under the sedition. Uh, sorry, under the ISA as well, and that that was why there was a huge call for a repeal. And then now the Sedition Act, and now we have this uh, new anti-terror law. And um, and of course, you you have a good point. It's not on the same uh, playing field, and a lot of people may not be aware about that as well when it comes to addressing terrorism. How different it is from addressing hate speech or inciting violence. It's not sedition act, mm-hmm. which is definitely questionable to, by everyone. Uh, but terrorism act is really a real security threat. We see that in what happened in our Sabah water. Mm-hmm. And we could see it happening in Peninsula as well, if there is any activities. And in the past, there are several activities like Jama'a Islamia where yep. they you know, penetrate or using radical religious belief to somehow influence people and these are very dangerous people that we are talking about. I guess the best that we can do is hope that they, the law actually gets used for the right reasons for terrorist uh, threats and attacks and not uh, for Malaysians themselves, especially those who uh, try to speak up against the government. I totally agree with that. <laughs> but at the same time, I think having a good monitoring body to ensure that mm-hmm. the law not being abused is definitely the way forward. Um, on the other hand, Gauri, do you like to fly? <laughs> yeah, I, I love flying. It saves a lot of time, actually, than taking the bus. <laughs> so our favorite, Tony Fernandez, <laughs> is calling for the establishment of the ASEAN Aviation Regulatory Authority. So, Asia Berhad Group Chief CEO um, has called the ASEAN countries to band together and form a regulatory authority to ensure c- civilian aviation is, you know, on the level of a very on the level of high safety standards. And uh, he actually based this on the European Aviation Safety Agency. Uh, and he wants us to come together and create something uh, similar as well and have a strong regulatory authority. And if we were to look at the European Aviation Safety Agency itself, some of their responsibilities include conducting analysis and research of safety, uh, authorizing foreign operators, giving advice for 
even drafting of the EU legislation as well as implementing and monitoring safety rules. So what he uh, was saying is that for something similar to be implemented over here on an ASEAN level. So you're probably called the ASEAN Aviation Safety Agency. I have a lot of hearts on Tony Fernandez because I think with so many flights, you know, being um, in the, you know, so many high profile cases mm -hmm. of flight g going, you know, not the kind of direction that we want to go, I think it it is important, you know, for not just companies like Asia or Mass mm -hmm. Airlines, but also governments to work together to ensure that we have the highest level of sta safety standards and also highest level of skills and fundings. And, and it goes back to the whole point of why people fly in the first place. Of course, there's been a lot of research that said that flying is actually one of the safest mode of transportation compared to a bus or a car. But with what's been happening recently, a lot of people have been also uh, been quite skeptical or, or quite hesitant about flying itself. So definitely, uh, for uh, if we come up with uh, a joint effort like this to address the security and the safety uh, of our aviation, it will probably help uh, to to boost the reputation. I think it's, it's, it is really important and totally behind this. But countries in ASEAN, in Southeast Asia, another, another thing is, do they have the political will and mm -hmm. the budget to do that? Because I think where Southeast Asia would be one of the highest um, or one of the uh, most flight area route in probably in the world in the next coming years because mm -hmm. more and more middle class people can afford flying and flying would be one of the probably main um, transportation uh, mm -hmm. transport mode for you to go to one place to another from one place to another place even for now for you to go to Penang, you don't ride buses anymore, right? That's right, because <laughs> but a bus takes like four to five hours and flying is. Less than one hour, actually, it's about 45 minutes to Penang. Uh, but of course, that goes back to the whole uh, idea of the trust or the confidence that you have. Because if I didn't have confidence uh, in the airline, I would probably rather take a bus, even if it takes me five, six hours to get back home. Because mm. nobody would want to risk their lives. So there's a travel ban by Thailand registered airlines. Oh, not travel ban, sorry, restriction imposed mm -hmm. on Thailand registered airlines and the ban would not have impact on Thai Air Asia as its routes were limited to destination within four hour radius. Tell me more about it. And it seems that this restriction was actually posed uh, by Japan, South Korea and China due to safety concerns and uh, after reading a couple of articles, it seems that t t most of these uh, Thailand registered airlines, especially their domestic planes, uh, actually do not meet uh, the international, the standards set by the International Civil Aviation Organization and same goes to some domestic Indonesian flights as well uh, in this case. Mm. So I think a better R&D is a necessary step forward. I, in fact, we don't really have that many or that much R&D, research and development when it comes to almost every sector. And yeah, especially in terms of uh, aviation, uh, it tends to be dominated by just a few companies. And of course, it's up to them whether they want to carry out the R&D or not, which is probably also why Tony Fernandez uh, suggested that we have uh, a regulatory or uh, some sort of a civil aviation safety so uh, they can boost the R&D and also work from there. Mm -hmm. So talking about ASEAN, moving on to another news is about the ASEAN Submit. Are you excited about it? <laughs> or you're like, ah, nah. It will be here in uh, Kuala Lumpur Convention Centre uh -huh. but it will also be, uh, uh, th the next day will be in, <coughs> sorry, in Langkawi. Mm -hmm. So one of the discussion focus would be ASEAN leaders aim to narrow economic gap in this region and they might be drafting a declaration. And also their key discussion will actually revolve around economy and how to narrow uh, the gap between different social classes. And of course Malaysia is the host to this like you were just saying. And uh, our plan is to integrate the private sector and to help companies to expand across the borders and of course they will be meeting in Kuala Lumpur uh, on April 26 before heading to Langkawi for an informal gathering. You know I really love all these ASEAN summits. Why is that? Because they travel to all these really cool places. 
<laughs> like little islands. <laughs> like little islands, yes. <laughs> and also, it's great that uh, we have all the leaders from all the ASEAN countries coming together. And it's uh, such a high-profile event that we are, of course, looking forward to, especially since we are ASEAN-focused as well at mm-hmm. Durian ASEAN. And uh, we look forward to it. Mm-hmm. I definitely look forward to it. But from ASEAN leaders, I think what they are looking forward is to integrate private sector, helping companies to expand across borders. And at the ASEAN Economic Minister's meeting last month, Idris Jala, Minister of the Prime Minister's Department, presented his pathfinding, uh, sorry, his pathfinding projects proposal to the ministers. So it seems like um, economy will be one of the main focus, if not the main focus. That's right. And the Pathfinder project, uh, according to Idris Jala's proposal, he's going to ask all 10 countries to come up with 10 different companies and then he's going to combine them, come up with 100 companies, sit together and uh, trying to figure out what are the problems that they are facing uh, in terms of trying to expand in other ASEAN member countries. That's very interesting. It is, but uh, what do you think about him selecting 10 companies? Is that a bit ambitious for, for the first part? or is that I, just I'm just about questioning right? <laughs> which 10 companies. Is it all GLC mm-hmm. or all SME or just MNC in general? Because at the end of the day, like uh, I think different sectors, a sector uh, of companies have different needs. The MNC, they they want to be global in mm-hmm. a way, as much as the SMEs and the GLC. But their functions are different, and their their supporters and the, their origins are mm-hmm. different too. So these are areas that governments need lo- to look at in order to integrate uh, the economy in all sectors. At the end, at the, you know, other, other than that, I think another focus, as we have talked about the anti-terror law, mm-hmm. is about religious extremism. And of course, one of the focus is to have a Langkawi declaration on the global movement of moderates. There and you go. Yeah, and this declaration calls for a commitment to democratic values, good governance, equitable economic growth, and adherence to social justice, and also uh, as a way to counter and address the root causes of terrorism, violent extremism, and radicalism. This goes back to what you were just mentioning about the uh, terrorist, uh, sorry, extremist violence and uh, terrorist threats that we have been facing in These Southeast Asia. These are real threats. This is not mm-hmm. just another political hoo-ha, you know, between the. Uh, different political factions. These are threats that cut across relig- uh, political belief, religious belief. So I think uh, addressing this as a whole uh, in Southeast Asia is the. It will take a stand step forward in terms of inter- good uh, ASEAN community integration. And uh, at the same time, I also hope that they, uh, as much as it's economic focused, I would also hope that they discuss some human rights issues as well, because we have been very uh, infamous uh, in the world uh, when it comes to human rights issues, especially certain countries in the region. Mm-hmm. But first, you know, according to Farish Eno, we need to plant the seeds of ASEAN identity first. But we'll talk about that after the break. <laughs> ASEAN Dailies, first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hi, this is Arlene. Hi, this is Gauri. And you are back again with us on our ASEAN Daily. So, I mean, I really want to talk about Farish Enu. He has been talking a lot about the Mm -hmm. awareness on ASEAN and one of his articles, which is called Planting the Seed of ASEAN Identity. I mean, it's not so much of a news here, but we can definitely discuss whether or not it is important to have that ASEAN awareness, especially creating that ASEAN identity among young people. Uh, I think for a lot of people, it might also uh, come off as a shock unless you've been really, really, really following the news very closely and checking about uh, keeping track of everything that the government is up to. It seems that in 2015 alone, suddenly everyone has become so uh, passionate about ASEAN, suddenly everyone but is we making are the first everything and foremost ASEAN. One. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are the first and foremost radio station uh, concerning ASEAN. But but yeah, suddenly everyone is just into everything that's ASEAN, trying to 
uh, come up with an ASEAN identity, ASEAN branding, uh, even when it comes to ASEAN uh, aviation. aviation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And this might be a shock to uh, probably like a layman reading the newspaper. Like, why why is it ASEAN everywhere all of a sudden? And he probably may not know what are we really up to this year. So what is what what Farish Eno was trying to say exactly? Because he seems to be going to school, colleges, and university, mm-hmm. trying to encourage discussion on the ASEAN countries. But he do it in a positive sign, with some realism and pragmatism. In you know just jumble it in mm-hmm. between but that's the reality even though ASEAN is a region that is uh, has a shared ancient culture and and so on and so forth but at the same time ASEAN is is also geographically and politically different from each other they are countries that are you know very much democratic like Indonesia mm-hmm. and the Philippines but they are countries that are being ruled by military generals they are countries that are being uh, somehow under authoritarian regimes and all mm-hmm. that so yeah we are quite diverse uh, and that may may or may not really be an advantage for us as well because uh, what he also mentioned was that in some parts uh, of Southeast Asia, the reaction to the ASEAN integration has actually been very negative. And they look at it as like the Trojan horse where uh, they see it as a way to push for aggressive and predatory capital penetration, weakening the local communities and threatening the... Uh, sovereignty of their respective states. I think and he mentioned mm. me, mainly. I mean, I think he's he he's probably focusing more on countries like Indochina area where mm-hmm. have, they have weak governments as well as economy. And also uh, to talk about the uh, local communities. I think the last thing that the uh, ASEAN Business Advisory Council or a- any proponent of ASEAN would want to uh, project is that. AEC will actually weaken the local community because uh, a lot of it has been actually about pushing the local community, pushing up the uh, SMEs uh, themselves, which is a huge part of the AEC. And it's not just about the MNCs or, or the GNCs that's on top. Maybe we can ask Tan Sri Munimajir about this. <laughs> yeah, we can. <laughs> and uh, well, I think he'll be pretty encouraged. Uh, sorry, pretty encouraging about the local communities as well. Like you like to give the example of the machi selling nasi lemak. Yeah. Everyone can benefit from AEC, and uh, it's not. Uh, it's very one-sided to think that oh, this is a very uh, elite thing that that's only focused on on the top. Uh, re- uh, sorry, uh, million-dollar companies, and it doesn't really do much for the local community or the smaller companies in the region. But at the end of the day, when we want to plant the seeds of ASEAN identity, I think we have to be very careful what kind of identity we are looking at here. And uh, I'm not sure what ASEAN identity is all about, but mm-hmm. I think if you are looking at the larger scale, it's about trying to you know, get to know your neighbours and be kind and be nice to them. I think that is probably what the closest thing I can imagine what ASEAN identity is all about. And I think also Farish Eno said that uh, ASEAN, if it is a place to have at all, it should uh, have a home in us. It, start, it should start with us human beings who have the ability to locate ourselves not only geographically but also historically, culturally and ideologically, like you mm. were also saying. Uh, none of us really know what it means to have an ASEAN community. Uh, of course, we try to have this uh, sort of uniformity among us like uh, if you come from Europe, it's very different when they tell you, oh, I'm a European. So how would you uh, address yourself uh, if we talk about the ASEAN identity? Would you tell people I'm an ASEANer or <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how re- does it really work? So I guess it really all starts uh, within you itself, how you feel about this region, you, you, going back to your roots historically, culturally and uh, having a sense of belonging as well. I think that's the word, having a sense of belonging. Mm-hmm. But you know, when we talk about the AEC, a lot of people might not realize it, but mm-hmm. there's a clause there. It only covers skilled worker. But what about unskilled worker? And the next news is about migrants from four countries eligible for health benefits. But this is based on uh, the, the focus on the country itself. And uh, apparently Thailand has made that uh, you know ten step forward in terms of protecting the uh, the rights of migrant workers to seek for health. 
And migrant workers from Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam can now buy healthcare insurance and enjoy the healthcare benefits that are on par with what the Thais themselves get within the country's universal healthcare scheme. So they are actually uh, giving the migrant workers the same amount of benefits as uh, the people in Thailand uh, itself. If I, if governments in Southeast Asia were to talk about ASEAN community, I think it's not just being selective on uh, things, universal things like mm-hmm. education and healthcare, but to encompass everyone in Southeast Asia to have equal standard of uh, benefits in terms of health, education, uh, welfare uh, to some extent and also opportunity for employment. So I think we are still mm-hmm. quite far away. That's why someone, whenever people talk about ASEAN identity, mm-hmm. I become very doubtful of it because mm-hmm. how can you talk about identity when it's not an equal level playing field among ASEANers themselves? And uh, also going back to this, of course, we were just reporting about uh, Thailand being the hub for trafficking as well, how they were selling all these refugees uh, to remote islands in Indonesia and um, giving them away to to slavery. And and they're just toiling their lives away, not um, getting paid enough. Mm. And it seems that uh, this is a a step forward from uh, for Thailand to actually do something mm-hmm. uh, because even at present they are a host to millions of migrant workers according to the news so this is definitely a step forward for Thailand to actually uh, be proactive and do something about the state of migrant workers in, in the country I say it's time for <coughs> countries in Southeast Asia to make migrant workers issue as part of the ASEAN submit uh, core discussion because when you want to talk about labor, it's not just the skilled labor, but also <coughs> the you know the unskilled labor. Or I think labor in general, they need to be protected, especially from Southeast Asia. And yeah, I I totally agree with you because why is it still not the core of discussion when migrant workers are pretty much everywhere, just moving around the region? You know, in Malaysia, in Singapore, in Indonesia, in Thailand, Philippines, everyone is just interchanging, going to another country. Uh, this is the real ASEAN identity mm-hmm. we are talking about, the real movement of people, but they are not protected under the AEC. So it's quite surprising that that's something that's happening every day, right, right in front of our very eyes, and nothing is being done to, to address it, and they are just being treated like slaves everywhere. Mm-hmm. And not to mention refugees as well, so I, I don't want to go further than that. I think <laughs> governments in Southeast Asia probably would have realized it. On another news about Indonesia, Indonesia. So Jokowi is considering hike in officials' car allowance. There you go. And uh, <laughs> there's two, tri- two things that are very interesting about this news. First one is, of course, he said he will re-evaluate uh, the increased car allowances for top officials. And the second thing is he said he was not really aware of what he was signing when he approved the allowances for the top officials. And this actually drew a huge outcry from all the Indonesians who want to know how can their president sign something that he is not aware about and this is not something that you expect from someone like Jokowi yes who is co- I think he's just too busy it's like oh, okay yeah yeah increase allowance <laughs> I will sign it it's a good thing <laughs> <laughs> but of course that did not turn out so well especially because uh, of the situation in Indonesia right now uh, for economic reasons justice and also because of the rise in fuel prices and it seems that if there is a rise in fuel prices shouldn't the allowance be given to the the ones who are not earning enough of money uh, probably earning a very very minimum wage as opposed to giving the allowance to top officials they probably don't need it at all that's the crazy part because i think jokowi needs to be very f- careful here because mm. he's being seen as one of the people so if he acts you know, the same as how the elitists would act. Mm-hmm. He, it will jeopardize his popularity a lot, especially it's just six months in office and there's mm-hmm. just a lot of things to do, a lot of things to fix. He has a lot of promises to develop the economy of Indonesia to increase the economic growth to 7%. So there's a lot of work there. He shouldn't be, mm-hmm. uh, I would say, uh, bogged down by such petty news, you know. And his finance minister... Uh 
Bambang has also argued that this allowance is actually nothing new. It's quite a common practice that mm. came in the rise of inflation. But this is an issue in the country because this can actually lead to further corruption, which Jokowi is trying very hard uh, to curb, trying very hard to overcome. Uh, and that's another thing that affected his rating as well, because uh, these allowances will be paid as down payment and it will be another sort of like an official installment for the top officials who mm-hmm. don't even need the money <laughs> like I, I said I really I don't know how to justify this mm-hmm. but if you look at Singapore right. um, the officials or the ministers have one of the highest salary in the world at 1 million or more so mm-hmm. I uh, my 1 million US dollar or more so I think the the problem is uh, is to it's not to justify why they should get that much money mm-hmm. is to understand like to some extent you know with uh, if you give higher salary to officials that really deserve it you can actually reduce corruption that's the Lee Kuan Yew's justification mm-hmm. and it's true if you look at uh, the Singapore model it does curb corruption in a way that you know when you are being paid in a salary that is adequate you mm-hmm. wouldn't really want to mo- have more but of course human greed you can't predict it that's right yeah. and uh speaking about indonesia and cars as well we know that a lot of indonesians apart from maybe jakarta they don't really uh have cars because it it's either you're really really rich and you can afford the car or you just uh buy a bike or you use the public transportation so that means that even if he were to give them uh, allowance it would probably still not be justified in that case mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally can't <laughs> disagree with that. <laughs> um, so our last news today, just a bit of uh, update about what is happening right now in Bali, in the, the Bali Nai case. So Andrew Chan and Muran Sukuman, Su- sorry Sukumaran, just buying time with legal appeals. This is being mentioned by the Indonesian AG. Uh, yeah, but however, their lawyer himself, uh, Peter Morrissey, said that. Uh, this is not the idea of buying time. It, it, people should be clear about this. Uh, he, they are actually trying to launch a constitutional court challenge next. And uh, it kind of makes sense because when you are in that position of these two guys and your whole life could just be taken away, you want to try to push for as much as possible, uh, trying to make appeal and challenge uh, every rule there is. I I think they are doing something great because mm-hmm. I don't think death penalty should be some mm-hmm. uh, should yeah. be uh, part of the ASEAN identity if I were to use that word. Mm-hmm. I think death penalty should be abolished across all Southeast Asia, no matter how serious the crime is. I think we shouldn't take away lives when so many lives are being taken every day. And now, so now it's down to uh, these uh, two guys, of course, to continue the fight and to appeal to Jokowi as much as they can uh, for uh, the clemency and see what he says uh, in the midst of all this. Yes. And for Indonesian, I think mm-hmm. in the long run, they should learn the lessons of what uh, we saw a couple of decades ago in, in, in Singapore, where uh, I think Sing- uh, Lee Kuan Yew Kin won kid for... Uh, one American kid for mm-hmm. vandalism and that causes a huge diplomatic uproar and somehow strained the relationship between the US and Singapore for quite some time until recently so mm-hmm. for for Indonesia you might they might need to consider you know to somehow mend the relationship between Australia and themselves not just Australia but I think a lot of the countries that are involved in this particular death row cases uh, mm-hmm. in Indonesia especially with uh, Jokowi, this could actually be an opportunity for him to uh, redeem himself and show people that he's actually capable of... Human uh, rights? Yes, (laughs) of championing some human rights issues. Well, let's just see. Anyway, uh, while he's being paid uh, (laughs) higher in terms of his car allowances. Uh, Anyway, uh, that's all from us today. Thanks for listening to our ASEAN Daily. And uh, do leave us any comment or feedback on our Facebook page or you can tweet us. And uh, also don't forget to follow our YouTube uh, channel for all the daily podcasts on news and interviews. So listen to us later uh, by 9 o'clock where we will bring you uh, the Durian Heat.